Um, so I, th I think well, 11 o'clock in the UK anyway, um, 8 p.m. down under in Australia, where our speaker um, this morning slash evening is, is joining us. Um, so um, hello, everybody. Welcome to the second in our summer series of seminars organized jointly by Urban History and the Urban History Group and supported by Cambridge University Press. Um, thank you again to Andrew McTominay for doing all the legwork around today. Um, I'd like to remind you all to keep your microphones and videos off during the speaker's talk. This is just to avoid interfering with, with the audio or visuals. Um, feel free to turn them back on at the end to participate in the discussion. Um, we welcome questions via the chat box, which hopefully should be easy for everybody to find. Um, however, if you'd like to ask your question in person, nobody did last time, but if anybody would like to do that today, please let me know via that function or um, by interfering in some other form. Uh, we would welcome as much participation as, as we can get. Um, I'm thrilled today to introduce Dr. James Lesh from the University of Melbourne. Uh, James is currently a postdoctoral researcher in the Australian Centre for Architectural History, Urban and Cultural Heritage, Akahutch for short. Um, James completed his PhD in 2018 and is currently writing this up for publication on the history of urban conservation in the 20th century Australian city. This is being published, I'm informed, by Routledge in the next couple of years. He's also co-writing with Rebecca Magin, a book on heritage methods and emotions also for Routledge. So watch your space, there's plenty to look forward to in the next two to three years from James. James is the author of various articles and opinion pieces for journals, including the Journal of Urban History, the International Journal of Heritage Studies, Historic Environment and, and, and many others, and hopefully for urban history in the not too distant future. Check out his website for more information. Uh, you can see a link on that opening slide there. Uh, as I said, we're thrilled to have James here today uh, to talk to the title Questioning the Consensus, Urban Conservation in 1990, Sydney and Melbourne. Looking forward to hearing what you're going to say, James. Over to you. Thanks, Shane. And thanks for that introduction as well. Uh, and to Andrew for organising the conference today. Uh, and also to the Urban History Group and the Urban History Journal for having me. And I really do value the opportunity to be able to, uh, on this Friday evening uh, from lockdown, speak to you all uh, over, over, over virtually anyway. I was meant to be in London uh, this time, if, according to my calendar, uh, but alas, things are as they are. So uh, I wanted to begin with a map of Australia and its major cities for those who are not familiar with, with the country. And so let's we can talk a little bit about scale. Uh, Australia, in, in terms of landmass, is the sixth largest country in the world. The distance between Sydney, the capital of New South Wales, and Melbourne, the capital of Victoria, the two cities I'll be talking about today, is more than 700 kilometres. So that's London to Zurich. And um, between Brisbane and Perth is about 3,600 kilometres. So from London, our measure, that would be to Tel Aviv. Australians hug the coast, particularly the eastern coast and particularly the southeastern coast. In the 20th century, the number of people living in the state capital cities grew from a combined third of the population to 58%. So we're talking about it in, just in terms of the state capital's highly urbanised nation. Um, in raw numbers, Sydney and Melbourne over the century grew from a combined 1 million people to 7.5 million people in the tw over, the, over that century period. In 2001, to so the end of the decade that I'm looking at today, 40% of Australians lived between Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, Sydney was a little bit bigger than Melbourne at the end of the century. So as you've probably maybe noticed while well, I've had this slide up, uh, you can see World Heritage sites on it as well. Australia now has 19 sites. There are 18 on here because the maps are a couple of years old. And the listings in the cities in particular are serial listings for the, world, for the convict, colonial convict sites, which includes uh, the items in Sydney and Perth, because uh, Australia, of course, was colonised by the British from 1788, and many of the city early cities were penal settlements. And then there's also the Victorian era Royal Exhibition Building in Melbourne, as well as the iconic Sydney Opera House. I'm sure you're, many of you are familiar with the Sydney Opera House. The most recent listing, though, which is missing, uh, happened last year at Bujbim, 
in Western Victoria. And I highlight this, this image of, of Butch Bim here as a reminder that Australia has a deep and ancient Indigenous history and past. Uh, the, and this World Heritage listing was remarkable because it recognised the aquaculture systems and structures built by Indigenous people over thousands of years in the region. And I think also I just want to highlight it today for us as urban historians as well for that longer history, that deeper history that we can study where we're looking at this example of a built and technological cultural heritage landscape, uh, an ancient human settlement as well which has been recognised, again, for the first time that cultural heritage, Indigenous cultural heritage, have been recognised on the World Heritage List. And I'll use that virtual visit very briefly to Buj Bim uh, and to, the, and to Guj, Gujimara country. To, I like, so I'd like to pause, because I'm, I'm speaking from Australia, to acknowledge country. And I'd like to acknowledge that not only the University of Melbourne, but also my home where I give this seminar presentation tonight or today on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of, uh, of the Kulin Nations who have been custodians of this land for thousands of years. I'd like to acknowledge and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I'd like to specifically say welcome or womanjeka in the local language here to everyone and specifically any Indigenous peoples, uh, people in the audience tonight. And tonight I'll be speaking about Melbourne or Nam, uh, which is the on the lands of the Kulin Nation. And here is an image of what the city of Melbourne looked like uh, in the middle of the decade that I'm talking about from the state tennis centre to the kind of uh, late 20th century skyscraper city built over a Victorian era urban environment. And I'll also be speaking a little bit about Sydney or Cuddy, uh, on, which is on the lands of the Uroa nations. And uh, here you can see the Sydney skyline from Circular Quay. This image is taken if behind, if you're looking at this behind you would be this, the Sydney Harbour Bridge and to the left if you kept going around the quay would be the Sydney Opera House. And so uh, to use uh, Nam for Melbourne or Cuddy for Sydney is to recognise both the ancient and ongoing Indigenous lands of our cities on which we in Australia work and, and live as well. So I wanted to briefly fr frame that and, and move over here to, to kind of give a little bit of a sense of how heritage regimes work in Australia and, and what I'm focusing on in this paper. So Australian heritage regimes, since they were kind of emerge merge uh, across the 20, well, they emerge off across the 20th century, but they've been traditionally divided into three distinct and separate categories. So while the philosophy of Australian cultural heritage is said to be universal and integrated for all kinds of Australian places, that's not necessarily how things operate in practice. And these three domains have existed because of their traditional mapping to three distinctive realms of scholarly and applied knowledge. And so yeah, Indigenous heritage, traditionally archaeology, natural heritage, environmental sciences, and then historic heritage, architecture, planning, and so forth. And I include here an example of historic, of what would be called awk very awkwardly historic heritage uh, of the Perth's 1860s pensioner guard barracks, uh, which had its wings of the barracks clipped in the 1960s to become, uh, for a freeway that was put through the middle of it, and it became the barracks arch, which is what it's known as today. And I think the categories, the kind of way that we relate to places, of course, isn't within these categories, it's just how the systems often work. And I include that image of, of uh, those that, ca that cave at Kuring Gai, uh, Chase National Park, which is in Sydney uh, as well. So, and I would say, suggest that is urban heritage as just as much as we see the built environment uh, in a kind of European sense as, as, her as urban heritage too. So I'll move into the, into the presentation. Uh, this paper explores values-based cultural heritage conservation and the relationship to cities in 1990s Sydney and Melbourne. And I'm trying to go, work through two different things today, uh, and I'll do it in, in sequence. The first will be to look at the invention of values-based cultural heritage conservation, uh, and that kind of happens in the kind of 70s, 80s, but it suddenly gets identified as, as, a, as a thing, as an idea and a, and a process in the 90s, and also the challenges and people who are critiquing that model as well in both Sydney and Melbourne. And so for those, and I'm looking at the, at the list here, and, there's some, and it's great to see there are a few people who, uh, re, who research in cultural heritage who have come along, so it's really nice to see you here. And for you, some of these ideas will be quite familiar of what, of what the values-based conservation is, and for others, they, they may not be. So I'm going to work through them. And I use this cartoon here, which I quite like in the promotion of the seminar, and it's a favourite of mine, and I'll, I'll contextualise it. It was published in a newsletter of, of an organisation called ICOMOS, uh, which is the International Council of Monuments and Sites, which is the official advisory body to UNESCO and the World Heritage System. And in Australia, that we have our national ICOMOS branch, and it also serves the, as the leading professional organisation for the cultural heritage sector. Uh, 
including for the heritage domain of cities, uh, architecture, planning and related. So it's kind of like the Institute of Historical Buildings Conservation in the UK. So here we have kind of a rather, what I'd say, ordinary uh, outhouse or toilet, or in the vernacular, it's, it's a dunny. Uh, and in the in, and in comes the Icomos conservation architect, and they say, well, excuse me, before you interfere with this culturally significant component of the national estate, the national heritage, the dunny, may I see your conservation management plan or your intervention policy statement? So the point is, and the joke is, that it, values-based conservation has within it a very particular model or system or process for the managing of historic places. And it was designed to work with a very wide range of kinds of historic environments. Now, the use of the title to, today, uh, questioning the consensus, uh, it, it draws on, on the, some, a few ideas from the literature and the urban history literature. The first is the growing role of cultural heritage in cities and urban management. Uh, the ways that heritage became an important aspect of city making and architecture planning and policy spheres following the modernist backlash which came with the heritage and environmental movements of the 60s and 70s. And this is observed in Australia, just as Mason and Page identify it for the United States or John Pendlebury does for the, for the UK. Uh, and meanwhile, I, I think it's also wanted to identify archaeologists who have had a really strong influence on the field of heritage studies, particularly in the last two decades. And, they, and, and from this work, work the work of, of people like uh, uh, Laura Jane Smith or Rodney Harrison, we, we, we get this idea of cultural heritage processes and practices as, as a cultural claim uh, to, to places, to objects and, and to practices in our cities. So when it comes to the consensus, and I've quite deliberately quoted Pendlebury here, he, he describes the consensus as a hazy one, uh, and I'll quote him, that exists over the desirability of conservation, end quote, in the late 20th century. Uh, and Smith talks about consensus in quite a different way. She talks about the, the orthodoxy in conservation practice and the ways that actually serves to veil disputes and debates within the heritage sphere about how heritage is done. So I suppose the paper is seeking to, to look at this question, this issue or this idea of consensus in two ways. Firstly, it's, the, it's, the, it's looking at the issue of orthodoxy within conservation by looking at the conservation discourse in Australia and Sydney and Melbourne. And secondly, it's, it's thinking about the broader haze of conservation as Pendlebury puts it outside of the immediate field and, and, and attempts to kind of critique that and think about that from other urban professions, but also the wider community as well. So the, the, uh, quite clearly the aspect of the consensus I'm focusing on is the values-based conservation values-based conservation, the way it impacts doctrines and, and regimes and management management processes. And uh, for those who aren't enmeshed within the field of cultural heritage uh, you might, or, and heritage in conservation in cities, you might be thinking, well, so what? Who cares? Values-based conservation. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it this way. Since the close of the 20th century, values-based conservation has probably become, and I can be, I'm happy to be corrected during question time, has probably become the dominant international logic for the ways that heritage works. And I include here three international examples of the adoption of values-based conservation. The first is Eng uh, English Heritage Booklet from 2008, and, it's, and the Australian approach starts to influence English heritage, I think, certainly by the 1990s. Secondly is UNESCO's historic urban landscape method, which, which, which quotes values-based conservation, the recommendation, and of course is used in Edinburgh. Uh, and also a new book that's come out of the Getty 2019, looking at values and heritage management, but really which builds on two decades of work at the, at the, uh, at the Getty Conservation Institute in uh, LA, advocating for values-based conservation across the United States. And such scholarship and guidelines and advocacy around values-based conservation, as, as I've suggested, were inspired by the Australian model. And an Australian model, which I'll show, is, is, is actually a product of urban, of urban development and I think can be in many ways explained through urban history as well. And this is a history that hasn't been sus sustained to much, uh, sorry, subject to much sustained historical analysis and is the focus of, of my research at the moment and, and that monograph, which, which hopefully will be coming out uh, sometime soon. And I think what's important was there was an entire questioning of the entire system of values-based conservation as an enterprise in the 90s. And those debates play out in Sydney and Melbourne and, and their implications for them too in the way that heritage is therefore managed. So in my abstract, I introduced a, a person here, Helen Proudfoot. So here, here is a photograph of her. And Proudfoot, I'd probably say, was Australia's first dedicated municipal heritage planner. Uh, 
She was born in the New South in New South Wales pastoral country in the Riverina in 1930, and she was one of many trailblazing women in Australian conservation in the post-war from the post-war period. And her career continues through to the 90s. So Proudfoot first works at the Post-War Metropolitan Planning Authority uh, in Sydney, the County of Cumberland. So she does a planning degree at the University of Sydney, and then she begins. She gets a job at the County of Cumberland for in a new role. Uh, as the planner for historic buildings. And you can see here uh, uh, an image that probably wouldn't be under play, out of place in any Anglosphere kind of planning authority in the kind of 1945. We're going to replace the old Victorian city with the old crowded city, doesn't let motor cars through, has, has, uh, doesn't separate functions, has children on the streets, so on and so forth, with the new kind of suburban dream of kind of garden city inspired idea. Now, I think it's interesting then that the, the authority recruits her specifically to deal with this, this issue or this question of historic buildings, because of course it's, it is inconsistent with what we're seeing there, but I suppose that shows by the late 1950s the ways that these attitudes are changing. And it also, I think, uh, problematizes conventional heritage narratives in Australian urban history, which haven't really found go uh, conservation govern governance regimes in the post-war cities. Proudfoot produces three volumes of about historic buildings in Sydney, uh, 1961 through to 63. Uh, and the, so the Cumberland Plain is a, is a large area and, and it covers the whole of the plain, the, the authority. And the selections for the booklets actually start being made in the 1940s. By the late 50s, is a committee uh, established which has gets 250 nominations from the Royal Historical Society, the National Trust, the Institute of Architects, or the local municipal councils. In the Central Sydney volume, there's 19 listings in Register A, 16 in Register B, and they're all predominantly colonial era, or they're all colonial era buildings of, from early colonisation, so late, late uh, 18th, early 19th century. And they're particularly inspired by architects, including William Hardy Wilson and his sketches, who had were, who were focused uh, aesthetic and architectural attention to George and Sid Sydney at the start of the, the century. Uh, uh, at a time where perhaps George and Sydney had, in a sense, been taken over by the Victorian Victorian uh, city of Victorian Sydney, I should say. So you see the interest in Georgian at that time and then a Victorian interest from the post-war period. And that, I think, in many ways, parallels developments across the wider Anglosphere in, in terms of those conversations. Proudfoot publishes a dissertation, which is always wonderful as an urban historian, because you get, you've got this fantastic material of, of her thoughts, and it's published in 1969, and it's called The Preservation Movement in Australia. The frontispiece you can see is uh, Karakor in New South Wales, uh, which is actually near where she grew up. So you can see the historic town where she came, comes from in the, in the Riverina. So now we'll get towards the end of her career. Uh, one of the last projects she works on is uh, when they're digging the, the foundations for a skyscraper in the early 80s, they come across some, well, some existing building foundations for a building from, from 1789, which was the first government house that was established in the colony. And so that to address that through the through the the through the planning system at that time and so they the skyscraper become, is redesigned to account for these for these foundations and uh and she's very much part of that pro development process the museum of sydney now sits on on that site uh, uh which is an excellent city museum i hope many of you one day have the opportunity or have already been there to see it so Proudfoot's work continues to the early 90s, where she, unfortunately she has a stroke and then she passes away in 2011 at age 81. So let's get to this Proudfoot speech that I set up in the abstract. So in 1990, she receives the Sydney Lucre Award by the Royal Australian Planning Institute. Uh, and this is, the, you could probably say, is the top urban prize that you can receive as a, as a planner in the plan, kind of planning and urban sphere in Australia. So it's a, it's a huge deal. And that's the reason that I outlined her career, just to kind of show how you can read the history of conservation just through the activities that she was engaged in. And so the prize recognises that outstanding contribution to heritage over the career. And then she takes that when she receives the award, she doesn't deliver a, kind of a, an accepted speech that you might expect. Rather, she identifies what, what you could kind of say is a new creature that's been born over the last few years. And she calls them the environmental fundamentalist. So she argues, and you can see some of the quotes here, conservation has become a moral imperative, she says. Our new instructors in the military conservation is telling us what we must, must not do and threatening global annihilation if we disobey. In quote. 
She also starts to say, a case could be made for listing almost anything under the general categories of cultural, aesthetic, scientific, and historic significance. The categories themselves are expanded to include social, archaeological, te technological, Aboriginal, natural, and contextual, in the quote there. And she goes on to say, and she's clearly pointing out this idea of values-based conservation that I'll get to in a little bit more detail in a moment. But in effect, the idea of values-based conservation, well, its intention, she says, was not sinister to begin with. It was more the desire to be inclusive rather than exclusive. But now we must take care to, not, to make sure that, that our towns and cities become so rigidified that every project is so delayed that we kill all initially while we ponder context and significance. We're preventing the dynamic change, she concludes, within our cities and towns, the fundamental aspects of, of urbanism. And how can a person who is uh, work, devotes her entire life to heritage kind of come to this conclusion towards the end of her career about everything that's been created, the entire mechanisms and philosophies of it? And she does so at the same time, the rest of the world's kind of like, oh, this is a pretty good idea. We're going to start to use it. Uh, and I've been thinking about this critique she made when I first came across it for, a, for a, quite a long time for that reason. So the, into the, the crux of what Proudfoot's challenging, as I, as I suggested, was values-based conservation. And I've mentioned ICOMOS already. It's established in Australia in 1976, this local Australian branch, by some major figures in the Australian heritage movement, uh, predominantly architects from Melbourne and Sydney. One of its first objectives is to write a charter or a doctrine for the management and conservation of all those different kinds of heritage places that I've mentioned. So Indigenous places, natural places, and 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 historic places and places and cities. And the Borough Charter sets off a chain of events which generates what becomes known as values-based conservation. So in global histories of conservation, such as that by Miles Glendening, the Borough Charter appears as an early example of a postmodern conservation charter. And the reason for that is that it rejects the apparent universalism, universalism of, of, of modernist traditional conservation, such as that uh, embedded within the 1964 Venice Charter, probably the most influential conservation doctrine that's that's exists. And the Borough Charter seeks to engage with that wider diversity of places for a distinguishable national context. And it suggests that systematic assessment of cultural significance of values over the art historical tradition of art of connoisseurship. And this way it was intended to be more democratic and more pluralistic than what I've said, kind of traditional, traditional ideas of European conservation as it was imagined from Australia. So some of the sites that they're looking at in the 1970s when this when this emerges is a place like Port Arthur in Tasmania near Hobart, a penal settlement established 1830, or Hyde Park Barracks, now World Heritage listed, designed by the convict architect Francis Greenway, Georgian building. Or a historic town like Gold Rush Mulden in regional Victoria, which was subject to substantial conservation study and work from the early 1960s out of the University of Melbourne. And that's from one of the University of Melbourne slide collection. Or another example from Melbourne, Como, oh, so moving to Melbourne, and Como House, which is, a, as you can see, a historic house associated uh, in, in central Melbourne, uh, constructed in 1847 and acquired by the National Trust in Melbourne soon after its establishment in 1956. And finally, uh, here you can see a couple of yeah, inner, inner suburban areas, which were also very much of interest by that time as well, urban ensembles. And so the idea is, well, how can we engage with these sorts of in, these sorts of 19th century Victorian era environments as well through the doctrine and, and, and the main one, which is adopted here through the borough charter becomes the, I think the townscape tradition comes in quite strongly. So the borough charter deals with a range of architectural and historical places uh, to it, and that's 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 its purpose in its cultural significance model. So I'm going to work through the, the, what the borough charter says about cultural significance and how that evolves. Now, if there was any borough charter purists here, they would tell me that uh, the borough charter needs to be read as a whole document and it needs to be read in order. Um, I'm not doing that. I'm picking out specific bits of it just to kind of demonstrate specific definitions that can to kind of distract about the sections of the charter. And that's the way, the way it constructs values-based conservation. So the first important bit is a section of the Article 1, which it defines cultural significance. And it means, according to Borough Charter 1979, cultural significance means aesthetic, historic, scientific, or social value for past, present, or future generations. And the other key article is Article 6, 
conservation options need to be ap appropriate to a place or a part of a place must first be determined by an understanding of the cultural significance, the values of its place and its physical condition. So what we're seeing here is conservation is guided by values and decision making is guided by values. Uh, the Barrack Charter then gets revised a number of times. The first major occurrence is in 1988. And you can see how it gets kind of expanded. Uh, there's a, a Article 6, for example, gets a, more of a description. An understanding of the cultural significance of a place in the 1988 version is essential to its proper conservation. So we actually see this idea of values-based conservation evolving and, and getting given a bit more a bit more detail in each consecutive uh, revision. 1999, it gets even more detailed, and 99 is a very major revision, particularly because it adds a new category of value called spiritual value, and that's intended for, to be for the management of Indigenous heritage places as a distinctive value. Uh, the application of the Barra Charter to Indigenous heritage has been questioned and critiqued, and it's a whole big debate that I'm not going to get into today, except to say that the Barra Charter was originally written by architects predominantly for architecture um, before it's applied more widely. So you can see here it continues those definitions. I won't read them out, except for the 2013 version, the latest version where I'll stop. And the reason I want to stop here is because it included a very nice uh, image, a very nice flow chart on the right, which really explains the whole process. You've got to understand the significance of the place. You develop a policy for the place, and then you manage in accordance with that policy. And so when we're talking about a place here, we're also talking about areas and architecture and individual structures. We're not just talking about a single building. It can be place, uh, can be very widely conceived. And so you can also see the ways that uh, Article 6 has gone from being a single item to being a very, very detailed item. You can also see how Article 1.2, the definition, has also expanded on the, on the idea uh, as, this, as this process of, of values-based conservation has been refined. And it is the dominant approach used across across Australia, as I've said. Through the Borough Charter itself is the dominant conservation doctrine in Australia that's used very, very widely. So, where do these uh, Borough Charter and where do these particular values come from that are that are identified here? So, they're actually chosen. It's one of those very boring explanations. They're chosen to match the Australian Heritage Commission Act, a federal government act from 1975. And the idea was how can we create a uniform national definition and a jargon free language approach to conservation? And the Australian Heritage Commission, after its establishment, it supports ICOMOS and many of the key players operate across the AHC, the Commission, and ICOMOS. The Heritage Commission Act selects the values based on a government inquiry into the national estate which was informed by submissions. The origins of the four original values are actually then become, go back to being post-war classification processes adopted by the national trusts in Melbourne and Sydney, again, created by architects. And historic and aesthetic, I, I would probably most likely say are inspired by traditional British conservation doctrines and, and ideas, which have already been set in place for a number of decades um, before they're taken up by the national trusts. In the 1970s, history refers to quite traditional approaches, national histories. Social actually referred to social history, uh, history more from history and below. So you see historical practice changing through the ways, through the Borough Charter. And then in 1990s, as, as social value becomes history itself, uh, at least in the way that was conceived, a uh, social value becomes a lot more sociological. And I've got a recent publication that looks at that idea of social value. So to an extent, scientific refers to archaeological and engineering value. And, and there was one archaeologist, Judy Birmingham, uh, on, who was a drafter of the Borough Charter, and she was also the only woman on the drafting committee with the other male, five male architects. And spiritual, I've explained, it sits outside, so I'm not going to talk about that. Um, and basically, according to, to a very controversial oral history of one of the Borough Charter drafters, uh, Melbourne architectural historian Miles Lewis, uh, all values other than historic and aesthetic were basically there for no reason other than they had to be because of the, um, because of the Heritage Commission Act, uh, although that's been disputed by some people. So let's see values in practice and how, how it's working in the 90s. So here's a, here's a site I've chosen to present to you, Sydney Maya Music Bowl in Melbourne during the Moomba Summer Festival. Um, photographs circa 1959. And this is the current registration, which was developed in the 90s in Melbourne. Uh, and you can see the Sydney Maya Music Bowl is of historic, cultural, aesthetic, or in brackets, architectural and technical importance. And then it says it's historically important for its relationship to the Sydney Maya Charitable Fuss. Trust. So he is a he's a 
a migrant in the early 20th century uh, from Eastern Europe uh, who sets up a department store and spends a lot of money because of philanthropists in the city. It's also of cultural historical importance as for its location for, and for search for open air cultural events and performances. And a well-known menu has architectural importance as a modernist purpose-built permanent outdoor performance space, has scientific importance for its engineering and construction techniques as well. So we have this listing and its management is then supposed to follow through against these values that have been identified for it. And the idea is whatever is done to this site can't, can, should not in any sense undermine or destroy or erase these values, but should rather enhance or at least maintain them. So it provides in a sense a limit of what can be done in terms of change to the, to the, to the architectural fabric and I suppose in a sense the use of the site. And of course that can be complicated in urban contexts as you can imagine when places are listed and and uh and but it's in some ways can also be used as a way of thinking of inspiring an architect or planner or a landscape designer by giving them parameters design parameters to work within or through as well so that all, all probably sounds quite good so i'll jump back to where i where i where i kind of started from with the proud foot issue because it sounds okay and the, the model itself is quite analytical and has a quite quite sound logic to it and i mean that's that's why values-based conservation has become influential so i guess you know on the, uh, it might seem that proud foot's appraisal of conservation might be dismissed as a spectacular provocation or even just the inconsequential polemic of a, of a notable figure at the twilight of her professional career. But I actually think that what she's getting at, either deliberately or inadvertently, is a fundamental issue at the heart of conservation and the consensus, and that's the, the negotiation of competing cultural values in cities. For her as an urbanist, she, uh, and coming from a particular sensibility uh, from the modern it, from the modern period when she started working, she, she believed in a particular model for cultural value assessments sh that should be adopted within the field and, sorry, she believed the model that had been adopted in the field and the profession, profession that, as she says, was preventing the dynamic evolution of cities and places. It was in a sense a misuse of conservation in her view by a narrow group of, of people. And Proudfoot was unhappy also, as I, as I identified earlier, about the seemingly infinite ways that values could value could somehow be identified for places and there was a tension around the appropriate values for use in conservation uh Mulberney and lewis miles lewis i mentioned earlier he thought the focus should basically just be architectural while another drafter of the borough charter james kerr who was a a, a sydney cider uh, and there was kind of two main schools of thought around this one in melbourne one in sydney uh melbourne being the lewis approach sydney being the kerr approach well he actually argued that that categories of value should not be fixed at all. He said in the conservation plan, which is a very influential do, uh, charter, uh, sorry, document to explain the borough charter and its application in practice, he says more precise categories of value should be developed over time in relationship to places. And, this, and the conservation management plan is the first major attempt to interpret the charter, as I've just said, uh, and a revised version still used today. And the conservation plan curse was also adopted by, uh, by English heritage in the 90s. So Kerr, Kerr's final edition of 2013 doesn't actually change this, this sense, sense at all. He's got this idea of the value shouldn't become fixed. It should actually be emerge out of the individual study of each place. I think it's also worth making clear that Proudfit was not criticising the values approach per se. Uh, in fact, she, was, she contributed to the model. Uh, she wrote a report for the Australian Heritage Commission in 1988 to define historic significance. And she came up with 10 things that define historic significance. Uh, so you can see there, and I, I suppose maybe that serves as comfort for all us historians in the room, that she does see a validity of historic value in conservation. And uh, I won't read out the list, but I think it's, it's interesting what she kind of comes to. And there was a range of interrogations of value uh, in the 90s, which is why I want to focus on this period. And I think in the end, Proudfoot in some ways actually does win the argument about value, a, a, a conservation value in a sense. Because by the start of the 21st century, the, the last couple of decades, there really were only five values carried through into heritage practice. And those are the five values identified in the, in the Borough Charter, the aesthetic, the historic, scientific, social and spiritual. Or in, as the Australian Heritage Commission advised in 1990 into some guidelines, these terms are not criteria per se, but they're the guidelines for specific criteria, end quote, which will be used in conservation. So the impact of the guidelines in, uh, through the Borough Charter is that it has the impact of streamlining particular values and streamlining the four or five of them. 
So in the, in the 1990s, in addition to Proudfoot, there are actually quite a number of different critical accounts emerging around this approach. And here are three quite influential ones. Melbourne practitioner, Chris Johnson, she actually interrogates the idea of social value and she makes it about present day communities and community building. Someone like uh, Miles Lewis uh, in, 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 this, in this interesting text that he writes, well, he actually suggests that conservation is being misused across the board to achieve non-conservation, non-architectural objectives. And a little bit earlier, uh, Melbourne uh, urban historians, Graham Davison and Chris McConville, well, they attempt to place public history at the centre of heritage practice as a kind of advocacy response to the apparent dominance of architects in conservation. They try and redefine what, what makes something historic. So there's a range of critiques, but they're all occurring around these particular values and what they all mean. So I'm out of time, so I'm going to wrap this up. So using Proudfoot's address from 1990, I've explored the genealogies and the influences of the values-based conservation in relationships to cities. And I've explored some historical critiques of values-based conservation from a number of different sources. And I think that what emerges through those crit critiques is that in the process of creating these new, new governance regimes, these new best practice guidelines and doctrines around conservation, certain ways of conceiving of values in conservation emerged. Certain cultural claims emerged to each of these values within the closed sphere of, of conservation. So these conceptions of value in conservation were quite distinct from scholarly or, or public and community ideas of conservation for the most part. They also differed quite remarkably across urban professions as well, whether it was architectural planning or archaeology or, or policy making. So then the question then became at that time was whether con values-based conservation had the sufficient capacity to be reshaped against external positive forces within its sphere the sphere that, that Proudfoot critiques so uh, pointedly. And I, I'd probably say that that's a contemporary history which may well still be evolving. But I'll, I'll say this, um, if, and it's going to be a, kind of a little bit of a provocation to finish up. Um, let's say, hypothetically, if conservation can't evolve and these 1990s challenges have begun to, begun to raise questions about the whole enterprise of values-based conservation, at least for Australian cities, well, that's a very interesting thing to happen just as it becomes the dominant approach to cultural heritage around the world. So I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank, thank you, James. Um, I feel like we should give James a round of applause if that's at all possible. I don't know if everybody wants to turn their <laughs> microphones on for a moment. Here, come along. <laughs> we could have attempted a series of emojis or something, but it seems a good old fashioned round of applause seemed appropriate. Uh, thanks very much, James. That was really absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm not a conservation historian, as you, as you know, so um, I, I, I learned I learned an awful lot myself. Um, and, I, and and just to remind people before we start the discussion, if, if you want to ask a question, um, it's probably best in the first instance to use the chat function, um, which you can find if you've got the same sort of screen view as I have, the chat function is at the top um, of the screen. Um, so if you post your question there, if you'd like to ask your question in person, kind of just make yourself aware, you know, make, make me aware of you and, um, and I'm happy to throw the floor open to you, so to speak. But James, I wondered, I, I was very interested um, towards the end when you, you mentioned Graham Davison and, and Chris McConville, um, as certainly Davison's one of the most well-known Australian urban historians, um, and I wondered. So you, you sort of you sort of said that they they start to talk about public history and the way that public history might help shape um, Australian heritage policy. And I wondered if you could just say a little bit more about that, and the, you know the the ways in which they were able to get their points across, and whether they had any success in doing so. Sure. Sure. No, that's, that's a great question. Thanks. Thanks, Shane. Uh, yes. So the, I, I think I gave a, a little bit of a paper um, at the Urban History Group in Belfast, which went into a little bit more detail about the Heritage uh, Handbook and about uh, Davison and McConnell and uh, the last couple of years since that, that excellent conference. I've also reflected on in light of this new work on values-based conservation. When it comes to the contribution particularly of, of Graham Davison, it, 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 I, it's it's a tremendous influence, and the reason for that is that he he was involved in heritage policy making in Melbourne in the nineteen seventies and eighties 
He was kind of at the core. He was chairman of the Heritage Council of Victoria in the 1980s, for example. And he writes a booklet in the mid-1980s called What Makes a Building Historic. Uh, and even today, that's still uh, a reference text that's used in heritage hearings uh, as, as, to, as to what Australians, in a sense, find, find as valuable. What he advocated for in terms of the relationship to history was he believed an approach to conservation needed to have more of a narrative focus because he said we as historians understand the way that people relate to places is through stories mm -hmm. and if we can somehow work through the through that in a more humanistic sense that will actually get to the heart of what heritage as, as a form of inheritance and as a form of community making is all about and although he ne he didn't use this this sense about he never kind of critiqued values based conservation because it's just simply not used as a term until the late nineties, but he is taking kind of issue with this idea of the way that history is being practiced and the and the way that heritage is being practiced, particularly with a focus on architecture because it's not focusing on those stories in his view. Um, so, and I and he's still making those arguments today, and he's still very passionate and very involved. So, in terms of his fundamental. Uh, contribution in the 80s it was tremendous in terms of his ability to kind of reconfigure values-based conservation it was at the same time he kind of stepped out of the debates the active debates unfortunately it's very early isn't it in 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 the history of public history the 1980s i mean i was yeah i mean my knowledge of it was that it kind of originates in the maybe the late 80s early 1990s so yeah it's very early he sets up the public history program at monash around mm. that time um, so no, it's it's certainly groundbreaking in terms of his 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 work in in, in Melbourne. Absolutely. So let's let's throw this open to the other participants here. We don't currently have any questions in the chat box, but maybe somebody wants to ask a question. Yes, hello, Richard. Richard Roger, you'll need to turn your mic just, on. Just as a starter, really, uh, thanks very much, James. Fantastic uh, overview of the processes and structures of the ch various charters and their evolution. Um, and we have a very clear idea from what you have to say about the professional proposals and the avenues by which these professional developments took place. So I'm wondering, given particularly your, your interest in Indigenous peoples, how does the public participate in the identification of value spaces? Okay. So if we, 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 I can, I, today it's quite a little bit different, but I'll, I'll talk maybe, are you, are you more interested, are you interested in contemporary issues? Responsible of how it's managed at that time in the in the night in the kind of eighties. Well, I'm thinking like. more these days. Uh, we have we have structures and and principles in place, as you rightly said, carried over into many different countries and cultures. But I'm wondering how far there is a possibility for the construction of valued spaces from below, if you like. Sure, sure. So there's. In, 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 term, in, in terms of governance regimes, there is two separate legislative acts, one that addresses in terms of the, uh, in terms of in, in the states, one which addresses Aboriginal heritage and one called the Aboriginal Heritage Act in Victoria, for example, every state has its own system and one which is just called the Heritage Act. Mm -hmm. uh, public participation within the kind of historic Heritage Act is involves, involves today through uh, nominations uh, through public submissions at various stages and various processes and then also the heritage council which is an independent body is meant to be of community representatives or at least of heritage experts representing community interests the aboriginal heritage system every, again every state is different but the way it would way it works is in victoria and it's and victoria is one of the stronger stronger models is that every area of melbourne or sorry every area of the state of victoria is divided up into a separate region and there's a representative Aboriginal party or group to, of that regional area. And there's particular triggers that mandate their engagement on particular issues, archaeological issues, 
and so those communities are brought in for this put in that case so for example if you search for the Wurundjeri uh, rap uh, I can tell, I can uh, I think I said in one of the earlier slides what how you, you can see that their role in organization is representatives of the community uh, in terms of the indigenous voice for them under the Aboriginal Act. Uh, that's that's how it kind of comes into speaking. But as you can kind of get a sense of it's two separate systems. So I think what's very interesting is what happens when we have sites which obviously have a, a, there are a lot of sites that aren't a, a, well everywhere is both. Right. So how do you how do you manage and, and deal and address with that? The 90s way they came up with this idea called shared value and shared value was if it was, say, a mission station or some other colonial site or 20th century site where, the, where there was a relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in a very kind of separate way. Uh, sorry, in a very demarcatable way, an understandable way, it could it can still get recognised through the through the historic heritage system at that point, and then it gets managed in that system. You can also sometimes some sites have to manage across both systems as well. But one of the things that is is becoming a very big concern, and one thing that the University of Melbourne is doing a lot of through because I'm now in an architectural faculty, is trying to embed Indigenous design thinking and Indigenous ideas right through the urban planning process and urban design process, trying to increase Indigenous participation uh, in, in the professions. I think there's something like, there's only been a handful of, 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 um, of, of architects, Indigenous architects who have ever graduated from an architecture school. In, in Australia, for example. So there are a lot of uh, affirmative uh, activities being being done at the moment, but this is a very much a future conversation as opposed to a, one, of, one of the past. Yes, uh, question from Rebecca Madgin. Hi, James, I uh, really en enjoyed that. And I guess my, my question really is about, you talked about the role of history and, 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 and Graham talking about the role of narratives. And those narratives are built on a range of different sources accessed through historical methods. So I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about in your kind of evolution of the Borough Charter and the discourse around values-based conservation, um, the role of sources and whether sources and methods have changed over that time, in a sense to answer the question, what becomes uh, acceptable as, as valid knowledge? Thanks, Rebecca. And I think that's that's a great a great question and, and a methodological question as, as well within conservation. And, and traditionally, the the dominant method adopted within within heritage practice has been an archival one, of course, because um, it's traditionally we've, we understood heritage um, as as something as a concern or use of the past, uh, and so, th so there were various archives that would be consulted, ones that are very familiar to all of us as, as urban historians, uh, such as street directories and, and publications and books by boosters and plans and architectural drawings and plans and, and all those things. Um, quite co conventional historical sources. But this, the shift starts to happen, I think you could probably suggest after the publication of Chris Johnson's book about social value in the 90s, in which she's suggesting, well, what if heritage has a has a contemporary dimension to it? Um, and on top of that, well, how, would, is, how do we assess that through a values-based approach? And so she starts doing uh, quite influenced by people like um, by by Lynch, by community organising and other fields, she starts to actually bring in ideas of surveying uh, communities, more 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 public submissions through the through the entire heritage process as well, and that that model uh, so that might involve nominations of local places by the community and so forth, and that becomes seen as valid evidence at least in her, the niche that she was pursuing through her private practice. But for the most part, it's been quite conventional uh, historical sources have been I'd, I'd suggest have been have been used and and, now, and then as probably now because it's a commercial enterprise that can soften the sources that are just the easiest ones to get a hold of as well thanks james what what, what kind of sources did proudfoot herself leave james beyond i mean obviously beyond the publications and the famous speech i mean are you able to get uh, personal papers for example I haven't come across her personal papers, but she's constantly referenced or producing documentation um, in her role as a public planner. So mm. the New South Wales Record Office has a range of, of her early material uh, there. 
Um, heritage material can often be, particularly stuff since the 1970s, can be very hard to get a hold of in Australia because it's bound up in the development process and heritage agencies don't like handing over those documents and making them always available, unfortunately. Because they're active documents and they're active in use, we can't get access to them necessarily as historians, which is which is a shame. But there, she, she does, unfortunately, no, she doesn't have the papers. All, all, the, all the men I've spoken to, they all have paper collections, Miles Lewis, James Kerr and others, um, unfortunately haven't been fortunate enough to find the Proudfoot collection yet. That, yeah, so that in itself is interesting, isn't it? <laughs> um, we've got a we've got a question from Aaron Andrews here, um, linking back to Richard Rogers' earlier question. Um, so he asks, what involvement, if any, was there of Indigenous Australians and organisations in the drafting or redrafting of the Borough Charter? Um, with the follow-up question, to what extent was the classification of spiritual value a settler construct? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you uh, so much, Aaron, for that. So this has been a, been a kind of a constant challenge and debate, but far more within the, the field of archaeology than than within the field of of uh, what within the field of kind of architecture and planning and, and policy areas that I've that I've directly engaged with in my research. Uh, what what. It, what the, there's been a, a in terms of the redrafting in the, by the 1990s with the new national kind of national policies towards reconciliation with the recon, uh, with the the kind of proceeds of the land rights movement in particular and the uh, and the uh, the removal of the, the the in 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 91 92 the Australian High Court found that the legal doctrine of terra nullius the idea that Australia was uninhabited on the arrival of British colonists was actually a fallacy, and it found the possibility of, of native title, so the Indigenous ownership of land in certain contexts. And so with, with ideas like that comes this far greater engagement with Indigenous communities. But really, interestingly, um, in, in, in terms of the, arch, the archaeology side of things and also in terms of the uh, the, the land rights conversations and native title conversations, there are sorts of debates that are kind of always kind of are kind of intertwee into kind of uh, interwoven. I should say it's getting late here. They're always kind of interwoven with each other, but they're not directly necessarily talking or engaging with each other. Um, today, today, particularly uh, Indigenous advocates, Indigenous architectural advocates, will say we need to be having these conversations constantly, but th these are relatively uh, new discussions. Um, and I like that you've used, the, interesting that you've, you've, you've referenced the term constructs. That is certainly a critique that comes out of the archaeology literature on the Borough Charter, this idea mm -hmm. of applying, uh, to put it kind of in a very black and white way, Western constructs and Western ideas and, uh, and epistemologies of, of knowledge, which, I mean, which quite literally a borough charter is an interpretation of the Venice Charter in many ways. So, value, and there are, there is an identification of values, not the focus, but it is in the Venice Charter. There is a mention of aesthetic and, and uh, of values for future civilization, uh, for future human uh, settlement and, and civilization and so forth. Um, that comes in the Venice Charter. So, it's a very much is a Western idea even if it will be recreated in Australia. Mm -hmm. So there's certainly that tension. It's a really key one that you've picked up. And I think uh, Aaron, and, and it's still one that's on ongoing in current conservation, uh, sorry, current conservation, current broader urban discussions about what it, what would a post-colonial, what would it look like if we were in, living in post-colonial cities in Australia, as opposed to the idea that settler colonialism is an ongoing process that's still, still happening today uh, too. Question from Bob Morris. Good waving, Bob. Your microphone's off. Yeah, I don't think we're able to get Bob at this moment. 
Yes, I can see your microphone flashing, Bob. I don't know what. I, yeah, I'm not sure what the problem there is. Um, hopefully, you're about, hopefully, you're about to join us. Does anybody, does anybody else have a question for for James? I can see a question from Lucinda. Oh, hi, Lucinda. Oh, Lucy, Lucy. Yeah, Lucinda Matthews Jones. In the chat box. Um, but I, I was just wondering, because um, with your paper, you gave kind of a really oh, good of overview of the profession. Um, is um, Proudfoot changing her mind because of its practical implications? And if so, are there, is she responding to specific heritage controversies around the use of um, value based heritage? Thanks, Lucy, it's, uh, for, for that question. And I, uh, in, in, uh, in some ways, certainly she's responding to the kind of developmental context of, of 1980s Sydney, and Sydney was in a huge, uh, was in a huge boom up until about 1992, 93, uh, hu huge amount of development that's happening. So she's certainly in a context in which perhaps she's perceiving that uh, that, that that the there's this kind of, there's this kind of preventative attempt by the conservation movement or at least the remnants of the conservation movement by that time to have a say in things that perhaps she doesn't think that they should and so I, and I think certainly by the by the 1990s if you kind of look back at the way which is I suppose a decade after the the kind of end of the heights of the conservation movement of what's called being called by the 20th century society in Britain, the heroic period of conservation is a period from the mid 1960s to the mid 1980s where, where, where the conservation consensus in a sense emerges. And I think a lot of the debates that are happening at this time in the 90s are in that shadow of, well, what's the, we've won, what's the value? What's the point of conservation now? I mean, there were particular views circulating just a couple of years earlier among the, the people, not necessarily Proudfoot, but among some people in Sydney and Melbourne, that, for example, Australia would stop building skyscrapers in historic environments. That would be it. There'd be no more major development in an area that would affect a historic building. What they didn't realise, of course, was that it was the, at that stage it was the tail end of um, of, of the uh, the oil crisis and the, the the slowdown in urban development that enabled so much of the legislation to come into being that would then be heritage legislation that would then, in a sense, be paired back at the same time. So you have a kind of a mixture of naivety and frustration, the conservation people trying to have a say where they can, trying to claim their relevance again. Um, and also this kind of question of this idea that, that conservation itself is, is a good in and of itself. And I think that's something that that really circulates too. So while I can't put a particular say, well, Proudfoot was concerned or took issue with this particular item, I think she's talking about the, the broader developmental context where there's a general frustration, particularly among the urban professions, but also in the community at large to some extent as well, that conservation is kind of losing its its relevance. It's fighting the battles of the 70s, perhaps. It's not fighting the battles of the 90s any longer. Mm -hmm. Do we have any final questions this morning or this evening? If Bob's microphone isn't working. Maybe he can send a carrier pigeon, maybe. Um, so that's great. So there's lots to look forward to then, James, um, in, ter in terms of the book and the edited uh, book that, you, that, you, that you're that editing with, with, with Rebecca. Um, much to kind of ponder on over lunch or maybe over a beer uh, later on this evening, James. Um, can I take this opportunity to thank James once again for a really interesting and invigorating paper.